Cool. So uh, welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Jen and I am one of the librarians with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries and one of your hosts this evening. Before we begin, uh, I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge the CZU Lightning Complex fires and the other fires that are devastating communities all over California. Um, it's been hard for some of us to go through this either personally or to wit witness our neighbors deal with such a massive loss um, on top of the ongoing pandemic. Um, what we're seeing is a direct result of climate change and the lack of actions that have been taken to combat it. And as a naturalist program, I want us to really think about that as we move forward with some of the topics that we talk about um, and find ways that we can either help um, combat climate change or um, advocate for, for, for um, a reduction of things like carbon emissions and, and do the best that we can as citizens of this planet we call Earth um, to, to help communities that are really struggling right now. Um, and uh, Marisa, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, um, well, thanks for saying that. And uh, just to reiterate um, how important it is to be there for our communities right now, I bet a lot of people who registered for this aren't able to stream in with us right now because they probably were evacuated. Um, so it's something that I, you know, I think we should remember as we're, as we're gathering here today. And also just to note that like, I'm really happy that we're gathering here today. It's been difficult to, um, to, to balance everything and to constantly be, you know, looking for, for more <laughs> updates. I'm personally really grateful for, for this, this little reprieve from that and to be here with all of you. And I do hope that we all um, uh, treat this as an opportunity to gather as a community when it is so hard for us to do that right now. And I think we need that. I um, also wanna share that the museum's created a list of resources. I know there's a lot of resources out there, but what I'm particularly um, like proud of for our list of resources is that there's really, really clear information for how to volunteer. So if, I know that we've got some volunteers for the museum who are with us tonight. Um, and so if you would like to redirect your volunteer efforts towards, um, towards supporting our communities right now, you can go to the museum's website and um, there's some really great ways to help out um, there. Uh, I also wanted to note that um, some of you may have signed up for next month's class, the Naturalist Night class, and it was billed as Coastal Prairies, which we will talk about, but I'd like to switch it to be about Redwoods for next month. So um, next September, one of my goals for, for this coming month is to really get as much information as possible on, on our ecosystems that have been directly impacted um, here locally. So we're gonna work on that. Um, and yeah, just thanks for taking time to be here with us. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and we also have a series of uh, resources available on the library's homepage. Um, there's probably a lot of overlap between the two organizations and what we're compiling and offering. Um, we do have some stuff in Spanish as well. So for, for those of our neighbors who are um, not fully literate in English, um, we have some options in Spanish as well. Um, so let me just go ahead. I'm gonna share my screen and just go over the sort of rules of engagement. Um, Okay, so like I said, um, this program is a joint effort between the Santa Cruz Public Libraries and the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Um, these are just some guidelines that we'd like to make um, upfront before we get into the meat of our program tonight. Um, do please keep yourself muted unless we're a, in a portion where we want to engage with um, with all of you, with the audience. Um, this is an interactive participatory program, so it's not just gonna be you sitting in front of your computer um, watching a lecture. Uh, this program is recorded. If you have any questions, please go ahead and enter them into the chat box and uh, Marisa and I will both touch those um, as, as needed. Um, if you have any tech assistance, we do have a library Zoom support person on this uh, call, so you can just ask them for help if you need it. Uh, this is a family event, so please keep language appropriate uh, and enjoy the presentation. And I think that's all I have for that. Hey. Awesome. Well, then I guess I'll take it away. Um, and like Jen said, this is going to be interactive. We're going to get there in just a second. But before we do, so, so get ready to talk and also to get a little silly because uh, I think we all need that. So we're going to start with some fun stuff. But, um, but first... I do want to just share a little bit about who I am um, and what we're doing today. So 
uh, here we go. So I am Marisa Gomez and I am the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. Um, maybe uh, can you unmute yourself really quick? And if you've been to the museum before, on the count of three, you're gonna say, um, I have. And if you haven't been to the museum, you're gonna say, um, not yet, okay? So um, unmute yourself, and on the count of three, have you been to the museum before? It's either I have or not yet. One, two, three. I, I have. have. I have. <laughs> I heard a lot of I haves. Um, we were drowning out the not yet, so that's, that's great to hear, <laughs> always. Um, so what I do for the museum is I facilitate lectures, workshops, festivals, hikes, uh, and now a whole lot of Zoom experiences. Um, I'm also a certified California naturalist, and I serve on uh, as vice president of the board of the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum. So that's that's who I am. Um, and just a little bit about the museum. Our mission is connecting people with nature and science to inspire stewardship of the natural world. And we do that through our core goals. And uh, I wanted to pull out a couple of those core goals that I shared with you all last time too. Um, and that is build community around stewardship of the environment create a dynamic place for learning, uh, dialogue, study, and exploration, and celebrate the diversity of species, people, and cultures. And um, I share those core goals because this series is meant to build community by celebrating the diversity of Santa Cruz in a way that hopefully instills in you confidence in your environment and confidence as a naturalist. Um, and again, you don't need to attend each month, but we will build upon themes and your repeat involvement will deepen your understanding. So that's our goal um, for this. And speaking of which, it's called Naturalist Night. So I want to chat a little bit and think about um, what it is to be a naturalist. So at this point, I'd like for you all to, um, to join in and share out. You can just kind of like speak up and we'll see how messy this gets. But if you have a thought, what do you think it means to be a naturalist? Advocating for preserving beautiful places in nature. Study and preserve natural places in the world. I just got certified as a naturalist also. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Was it all virtual for you? Yeah, it was, we did independent field trips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How was yeah, that? It was exciting. It was different. It would have been nicer to be in person, but you know. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's a, it's probably the same program that you see forestry. Anyway, yeah, uh, you see Davis one. Um, but oh, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, the one I went to was through the Arboretum here in Santa Cruz because it's oh. they've got different campuses. Cool. That's great. You went to one in Davis. That's mm -hmm. or, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so what did you learn? What do you what do you think a naturalist is after going through that? Oh yeah, I would say it's someone who has a pretty good foundation on the conservation and the local uh, ecosystem, and then also how to be able to communicate that with other people. Yeah, great. Uh, does anyone else want to add anything? These are all great. Great. We've talked about advocacy, appreciation, communication. What about documentation? Documentation, yeah. Yeah, I think for sure um, any good naturalist records their observations, right? That's, and that's something that we'll be talking about today, too. That's always a great tool of being a naturalist. And I just want to share that um, for us at the museum, what we believe is a naturalist is someone who observes the natural world over and over and draws meaning from those observations. Um, and that's really all it is. And like, and so what the meaning is can lead to advocacy. It can lead to communication. It can lead to, to sharing um, what you appreciate, but really any, all it takes to be a naturalist is to be someone who observes the natural world and does it over and over and tries to find meaning there. And so, um, I hope that you all consider yourself naturalists. You don't have to be a certified naturalist to be a naturalist, but it sure is fun. Um, and it sure is cool to be able to say that. Huh, oh, Megan? Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today is uh, working on becoming better naturalists because we all are naturalists already. Um, and so last time, um, a lot of you probably joined us, but maybe some of you didn't. Um, we talked about Santa Cruz habitats and history. We did a general overview. And we focused on the impacts that have um, helped shape the different habitats that we have in Santa Cruz. Um, and those impacts that we went over were vast. <laughs> There's kind of a lot that we covered. Um, and so that's kind of like the basis, the foundation for us now zooming in to different habitats. 
And today's habitat that we're going to be talking about is the intertidal zone. And this is the time when I want us to get a little bit silly. So I would like, if you are willing, um, if you currently have your video off, if you're willing, you don't have to keep it on for the whole time, but if you are willing to turn it on now, this is kind of like a visual exercise that we're going to be doing. <laughs> so you're welcome to join us. Um, and what I would like for us to do is envision, so maybe turn it to gallery view. If you currently have it on speaker view, turn it to gallery view so you can see everyone. And I want you to envision a tide pool creature. So just pick a tide pool creature that you know of. Even if you don't know much about tide pools, you probably know of like one animal that you're likely to find in the tide pool. So pick one tide pool creature. Okay, we all got one. And now, Start to embody it with your body. So we're all, I think we can all use a little movement, right? And a little loosening and getting silly. So everyone pick whatever your, your, uh, your creature was and embody it with your body. And you can have like sound effects too. You can unmute yourself, that's fine. Mine's <laughs> Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put Jen on the spot. And Jen, so everyone look at Jen. So Jen, wave again so that we remember who Jen is. All right, so there's Jen. So everyone look at Jen. And Jen, we're going to have you um, do your, your tide pool creature, okay? And then um, if you think you know which uh, cre or, uh, organism Jen is being, you can just shout it out, okay? So Jen, start being your organism. <laughs> Anyone think they know? Crab. Crab. Yeah. Does anyone know of a, a name of a certain type of crab that's in the tide pool? Rock crab. Rock crab. Okay. Maybe Jen is a rock crab. Cool. Does anyone else want to want to volunteer to demonstrate their tide pool creature and we can guess? Okay. Megan. Okay. okay. Ready? Yes. Hang on. Any ideas? Oh, a hermit crab. Barnacle? Anemone? Yeah, the green anemone. Anemone. Oh, okay. How did you know? How did, how did I know? Yeah. Uh, I was looking at anemones this morning and those little like tent tentacly bits that are covered by like a solid green color. Yeah, okay. Does anyone else wanna, wanna do one? Show us your tide pool creature and we can guess. I can do mine. All right, so mine is a little tougher. I can tell you, for this organism, you normally think of it, you don't think of it doing what I'm doing, but this is how they look when they're in the tide pools. Are you a clam of some sort? And certified California naturalist. Very good. <laughs> so yeah, clam. Does anyone know? Can you explain like why this means clam? Oh, you're. You've got your siphon working, so you're bringing in water one way and spitting it out the other way. Yeah, and I love that because I. The reason why I chose that is because it was one of the most shocking things, experiences that I've had out in the tide pools. I was on a guided hike with our executive director who studied marine biology. And I saw this like jet of water, just like periodically every once in a while coming out. I was like, what is that? And uh, she, she, like we walked over and we were looking and it was like this odd fleshy stuff. And um, she, she told me that it was a clam. And I was like, that's not a clam. No, <laughs> clams look like this. They got shells, I don't see any shells. And it's that it's down under and it's the siphon, siphon working. So, um, so yeah, love that. So that was fun. Thanks for doing that with me. I thought that that would be a fun um, way for us to get in the mood for this um, this habitat that we're going to be that we're going to be talking about. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. And if we're talking about tide pools, we got to start by talking about tides, right? And this is kind of the most intimidating part for me is talking about the tides. So I'd like to um, put this up. Take this off my shoulders and put it on you. Does anyone want to um, volunteer what you think tides are? What are tides? You can just start, someone wants to start talking and share what tides are. 
the effect of the moon's gravity on the ocean. Okay, so we got the moon, we got gravity, we got the ocean, for sure. Those are all important parts. Does anyone want to add on what Kathleen said, said just then? And the effect of the sun. And the effect of the sun. Very good. Anything else? I saw a meme, and I teach my students, I teach earth science and astronomy, and I tell them that the tides are just, it's the moon trying to steal our water, but it's really bad at it. <laughs> They see a bulge wherever it's moving. Yeah, for sure. I love that. That is so good. So let's let's get into it a little bit. Um, so this is kind of a probably a blurry graphic for you, but <laughs> um, tides are one of the most reliable phenomena in the world, and that's partially because they are dependent on astronomical systems that are also pretty reliable, like the sun and the moon. Um, they are very long period waves that move through the oceans in response to the forces exerted by the moon and the sun as we learned just now. Um, they actually originate in the oceans and progress towards the coastlines where they appear as the regular rise and fall of the sea surface. So we, I think, often think of tides as just being something that happens right on the coastline, but it's, it's happening all over the Earth's oceans. Um, and really what it is is when the highest part or crest of this wave reaches a particular location, our coastline, that's when high tide occurs. Low tide, corresponds to the lowest part of the wave or the trough. And the difference in height between the high tide and the low tide is called the tidal range. Um, and to demonstrate the effects of the moon and the sun together on this phenomenon, I wanna use a graphic um, from NOAA. So hopefully this is coming up for you guys. And it's a, uh, uh, Jen and I were arguing, not arguing, we were talking about <laughs> um, what to call this, a GIF or a GIF, I'm not sure. Um, I think we just determined that it's supposed to be GIF, but it's okay if you say GIF. Um, so you can watch this go as I explain this a little further. So during full or new moons, which occur when the Earth, Sun, and Moon are nearly in alignment, average tidal ranges are slightly larger. Larger. This occurs twice each month, at the new moon and the full moon. In both cases, the gravitational pull of the Sun is added to the gravitational pull of the Moon on the Earth causing the oceans to bulge a bit more than usual. This means that high tides are a little higher and low tides are a little lower than average. And we call these the spring tides. And it doesn't have anything to do with them happening in the spring. It, they happen every month. It's, I think, more has to do with like the springiness of them. They're like, it pulls a little, a little further, I think. Um, and so seven days after these extreme tides or these spring tides, the sun and moon are at right angles to each other and when this happens, the bulge of the ocean caused by the sun partially cancels out the bulge of the ocean caused by the moon. And this produces moderate tides known as neap tides, meaning that high tides are a little lower and low tides are a little higher than average. And neap tides occur during the first and third quarter of the moon when the moon appears half full to us. Um, does this, does any, have I lost anyone yet? Does anyone want to ask a clarifying question or correct me <laughs> All right, feel free to chime in. I'm gonna share another resource. Um, one great activity that you can do to get used to this effect is a lunar phonology wheel, which we have a video tutorial for, and it's just a way of recording your observations based on where we are in the lunar cycle. So this is a great observational and reporting activity like we were talking about earlier, being good naturalists. Um, so if you wanna kind of like just really, really understand and, and really see these, these impacts of the tides. Um, so my next question for you is, doo -doo -doo. sorry. One second, I gotta make sure I got my notes. So my next question for you is, why would we care about the tides? Why is this something that we wanna know about when they're gonna be low and when they're gonna be high? Or maybe another way of wording this is who wants to know that? Anyone wanna share a guess? Who's concerned with the tides? People who Surfers. don't want to have to. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Surfers and also people who want to poke around in tide pools but don't want to have to get up at five in the morning to do it. For sure. And I also saw Megan going like this, so like anemones. So yeah, anemones care. Um, yeah, all your critters that are living on the beach. 
Yeah. And then also, um, yeah, if you want to go uh, look at these organisms, if you want to go explore the tides, knowing when the tides are is, is useful. But then also I heard surfers. Surfers want to know, right? Does, is anyone here a surfer who can share why the tides are useful for surfers? I think it has to do with the direction of the waves and how they surf them, something like that. Okay. I, I'm not a surfer, but I did a little reading. This is what I got, okay? Um, so if the tide is too high and is rising, each successive wave will push higher. While if the tide is high and falling, the energy in the waves will decrease with each wave. And as the tide approaches low tide, the waves will be less powerful and more flat. Um, so all of that impacts how you're gonna be surfing and what the waves are gonna look like. Surfers also care about swells and, um, and like the location of where the waves are on the coast and what's going on underneath water too. But the tides are important because it impacts the energy of the wave and how big that wave is gonna be. Um, and how much energy you've got behind you, like pushing you um, for it, so how fast they're going to. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, why they care. And one of the things that they use is a tide chart. So one of the resources that we're gonna be sharing with you um, is this link to, to Noah's uh, tide chart. And so you can start to read it and get used to it. And like, you can see that today's tides um, and like tomorrow and the next day, it's all, like not really too low. Like I guess maybe 1 a.m. on Thursday, that's like an okay low tide, but it's 1 a.m. on Thursday, right? So you look at these and you're like, oh wow, that's 4 p.m. and it's a negative one? That's like fantastic because it works with my schedule. So um, this is a great tool to, to start to, to get used to. Um, There's a comment in the chat about people who fish also care about tides. And okay. this person used to be a clam digger, which I can imagine uh, matters heavily when tides are, if you're digging. Yeah, them. absolutely. So foraging, we're going to be talking about foraging too. Sorry, I keep having to like do this. La -di -da. You're just going to have to see my, my um, desktop. That's the way that we're going to do it. Um, okay. So now that we've kind of understood what um, tides are, we're going to be thinking about the habitat that is there because of tides. And we call this the intertidal zone is the habitat, but there's within that there are intertidal zones. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about those zones. So intertidal zones exist anywhere the ocean meets the land, and that can be from steep rocky ledges to long sloping sandy beaches and mud flats that can extend for hundreds of meters. So there's lots of different types of habitats within the intertidal zone. We're going to be focusing on the rocky habitats of the intertidal zone. Um, and we're going to talk about the divisions into zones. So these are the zones of the intertidal zone. Um, let's start at the bottom, or you can also think about it as like the farthest out and that is the subtidal zone. So that's a part of the coastline that is never exposed by low tide, it remains underwater, okay? Then you've got the low intertidal zone, which is virtually always underwater, except during the lowest of spring tides. So only when the tide gets extremely low is it um, in the month. So every month it does, but it's not very regularly. And then is next we have the middle intertidal zone, over which the tides ebb and flow twice a day. So these are, they're very regularly covered and then not covered and covered and then not covered. Um, after that, you've got the high intertidal zone, which floods during the peaks of daily high tides, but remains dry for long stretches between high tides. Um, so totally different set of circumstances. And then we have the spray zone, which is basically just dampened by ocean spray and high waves and is submerged only during the very high tides or severe storms. And so we also see that different species in these different zones exist because these are incredibly diverse microclimates. In order to survive in the high zone, you're going to need different adaptations than you would need to survive in the low zone. And they might be like, um, you know, just a couple of meters from each other. They're very close and yet so disparate. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, 
Sea creatures arrange themselves vertically in the intertidal zone depending on their abilities to compete for space is one factor, to avoid predators from above and below, and then also to resist drying out are some of the factors. So we're gonna think first about the high zone organisms. And I'd like for you guys to take a look at some of these common high zone organisms and just shout out an observation that you have about these. Lots of cover and lots of shell. Yeah, they look tough. They do look tough and they all have shells. They all have shells. <laughs> um, so that's like a, comp that, you don't see any organisms here that don't have shells. Um, so that's really important. Um, residents of the higher intertidal zones can either close themselves up in their shells to remain moist and ward off predators or are mobile enough like this shore crab here um, or like uh, Jen's rock crab <laughs> uh, to retreat to a submerged zone when the tide goes out. So they don't have to stay there. They can go find another place to be. Um, so that's a very important factor of this zone. Then we go into the mid zone. So this is the area that's like a constant ebb and flow. Who wants to chime in with an observation about these organisms? Anything different from the last slide that we saw? I'll show you again. This is high zone, mid zone. More exposed to squishiness. So squishy. Yeah, most everything you see here is squishy. There's still some shelled organisms like that snail and that crab but you also start to see the squishy stuff. So the things that don't have those protections, um, they have their own types of protections. Does anyone know what anemones do if they get exposed and aren't like in submerged in water anymore? They yeah, close they, up. Yeah, they, they do, they close up. So it's not ideal, it's not as good as a shell, but it's something and they can protect their, their, um, their tentacles and they can make themselves smaller and really retreat back so that enough that they may actually be submerged in water. And also you often see them like pushing themselves out even further so that they can dip down into the water because they're right on the edge of it. They're very odd um, creatures for sure. Uh, so yeah, less sturdy, a little bit more varied too. We've got more variety of species here. All right, low zone. Any observations about the low zone? Are these all mobile? Yeah, we see a lot more mobile um, options here. Are they mobile like the crab is mobile? No, they're definitely all submerged, huh? Yeah, so they're submerged. They're also like, do you think that the sculpin would be mobile in the high zone? Yeah, these are mobile creatures, but mobile only in water. Um, so that's something you start to see more of those organisms in the low zone. Um, and then also, you're not seeing it so much in this description of low zone organisms, but also oftentimes um, they, you're more likely to see uh, species that attach themselves in place and are very sturdy, very flexible, or otherwise well suited, well suited, bleh, suited to stand up to wave energy. So that's another thing. So these fish, you know, they can move around, they can hide under rocks, but other animals that are dealing with this constant movement of water, they may also um, benefit from being able to hold on tight. So these are, you see a lot of different variation throughout the tides, which is why it's great to go at low tide because you can see the most um, variation of, of organisms. Also want to point out um, that the tides have an impact on larger marine life too, um, such as seals, sea lions, and fish who all play a part. So those animals I just listed find foraging for food ideal at high tide in the intertidal zone. So they can go and go over all of those tide pools and find lots and lots of, um, of really wonderful uh, stuff to eat. Um, these organisms that are able to get everything that they need from being able to be like close to the sun and also have like this variable water and um, and these little pools for protection, these larger marine life are able to take advantage of that. But then you also have things like this egret, this great egret, who um, Kathleen and I call Greg, great egret. Um, Greg here uh, enjoys hunting at low tide when there's lots of rocky tide pool area to walk around in. It's a lot easier for something, someone like a great egret to hunt at low tide than it would be at high tide. Um, so here's just a naturalist tip for you because we're all trying to be better naturalists here. Um, let's go to the tide pools at different points in the tidal cycle and record not only what you see in the tide pools, but also what larger animals are present and where and see if you notice any any um, uh, trends there. I think that would be a really great observation to look at. 
Does anyone have any questions or things to share at this point? Okay, so we're gonna be moving on now to tide pools. And I know it seems like we've been talking about that, but not really, we've been talking about these zones, but in order for us to be talking about the organisms we're talking about within these the intertidal zones, the ones that we've called out in particular, we have to be talking about a rocky intertidal zone. It's not, this isn't happening in the beach intertidal zone, for instance, sandy or mud flat. Um, so we're talking about tide pools this is, another, is another word to describe this rocky zone. And a tide pool is an isolated pocket of seawater found in the ocean's intertidal zone. It's where seawater gets trapped as the tides recede. So these exist in each of our zones. And it's, you know, part of the reason why many high zone organisms are able to survive because there are still pockets of water that stay there. Um, as well as it's useful for the mid and low zone organisms too, because the tide is going out and they, these may be organisms that really need to be submerged at all times. And so um, they affix themselves to the divots within the rock, not on the high parts. So that's another thing to observe when you go out is what do you see on the upper edges of your rocky zone versus what do you see lower in it? Do you notice anything even within that, even for a couple of inches from each other? Um, and another thing to think about with tide pools is that as ocean water retreats outside the tide pool during low tide, the re resident marine life must endure hours exposed to the sun. They also have low oxygen and increasing water temperature, and they also are more at risk for predators. So these are all factors that impact how you are able to survive in that area. So all the animals that exist within the high and mid zones are adapted to be able to deal with periods of lower oxygen, with periods of higher temperature, where maybe other organisms in the ocean would not be able to survive there because they're not adapted for it. All right, so tide pools. So um, not all of you may live in the Santa Cruz area or be here right now. I would assume that probably most of you um, are familiar with the area since you found out about us. Um, if not, well, you know, come visit when it's appropriate and you can go visit our tide pools here. Um, so who, let's just share out where are your favorite places to go tide pooling? Say a, say a location that you go to. Natural bridges. East Cliff. Point Lobos is on my list, but I haven't been there yet. Point Lobos. Lobos. Point Lobos? Point Lobos. Okay. Oh, yeah, totally. It's worth it. Yeah. A little farther from Santa Cruz, but still part of the Central Coast. I'll allow it. <laughs> yeah, so I've got some, some uh, options to share with you. These are all taken from the Visit Santa Cruz Guide to Tide Pooling. So it's legit. They say it's so. Uh, so this first one is uh, the picture that they share from Natural Bridges, which was um, already noted. So Natural Bridges is famed for its arch, um, but also on the other side of the beach there, great tide pools. This is from Wilder Ranch, which was also um, listed. This one was not listed. You can go a little farther up coast. This is uh, part of Davenport Landing Beach. So around Davenport, there's also great tide pools. And then someone mentioned East Cliff. So this is Pleasure Point, and that's one of my favorite places. I always go tide, that's where I go tide pooling, is um, the Pleasure Point area and the Hook. And that's also, the museum has a science collecting permit because we have a tide pool in, um, on exhibit, and so that's where we usually collect our organisms. So. Um, and so while we're talking about tide pools, I also just want to take a moment to talk about the rocks because I'm really into geology, but also, I feel like this is an area that's not often talked about when we talk about tide pools. We're always talking about sea anemones, but like who spends the time to talk about the rocks? Because these organisms would not be there if it weren't for the rocks. So I want to take a moment. I think I'll just like stop sharing my screen um, for right now and let's chat. Why are there these divots in the rocks there that these pools of waters can form in? What's going on? Some rock is less hard and dissolves more readily. Okay. Is it the natural wear of the tides crashing or the waves crashing onto the rock? The picture you just showed, you definitely see uh, splits along sediment lines. 
-hmm. Yeah, this is good. This is really good. Um, so the splits are super important. Uh, we also heard that um, we're talking about erosion. And then also I heard Kathleen say something about like soft rock, hard rock. So there's also something there too. Um, and basically it comes down to, it could be a chemical factor, a biological factor or a geological factor. And oftentimes it's kind of all of them working together. Um, so you're right, like there's, there's erosion happening on these rocky coastlines, but the erosion is not happening equally. And there's a reason for that. It's because of what's going on with the rock. Cause it's, you know, if the wave is all like impacting it at the same location and everything's the same, you're not gonna be getting these holes, right? Um, so it's because of some variability there. And that variability might be because of variation within the sediment itself that formed that rock. So there's a little bit softer rock, like, you know, this pool, this sediment pooled up and it was a little bit finer and this one was a little bit rougher and the rougher stuff is a little coarser and so it's a little bit more prone to erosion and so it starts eroding there. And that is called like a feedback loop. And so the moment that erosion starts, it just keeps going and it gets easier and easier and easier. And so you end up getting these more extreme divots. So that's one factor. Another geologic factor is what Megan pointed out, these fractures in it. That's because along the coast here, we've got a lot of fault zones and it's causing this stress for these um, fractures to happen. And then that's also the same impact of when that erosion happens it's wearing away at different levels based on what the um, weakness has already been caused there. Other weaknesses can be biological, such as our friend the clam. So clams, there's like the boring clam, um, which is anything but boring. It, uh, bore, it can actually like, travel into rocks. And um, in the fossil record, you see these divots in there. Um, but also they're still doing it and they can work really fast. And so that's also creating a weakness. It's creating an area for erosion to happen at a different rate. And so you're getting these pools. There's lots of different reasons and ones that we haven't mentioned here too. And I'll share a super highly technical article about this that doesn't get into all of this, but it gets into some of it. It was really hard to research, um, but the museum does these uh, geology programs every week with two Geologists from UCSC, Gavin and Graham, the geology gents. And so I've learned a lot about our local geology from that. So this is kind of pieced together by my, my hypotheses as well as some research. Um, okay, so another area of the tide pools that I think is underappreciated and not talked about enough because the anem anemones get all the attention are, is algae. I love algae. And, um, it's going to be really difficult for us to get into all of the details that I want to get into about algae, but I just want to make sure that we spend some time being acknowledging that when you go out to the tide pools, you should give algae your attention. And one of the easiest ways to give it your attention is to just notice, like, are you looking at green algae, brown algae, or red algae? So algae can be um, single-celled organisms, but it's also multicellular are the ones that we generally see in these um, intertidal zones. And they're simple non-flowering and, and aquatic organisms that contain chlorophyll like plants, but they are not plants um, because they lack true stems, roots, leaves, and vascular tissue. And um, of these multicellular ones, we've, they're either green, brown, or red. So just start by going out there and looking for how many different types of species of algae you can find and categorizing them by that. And like, say you say, okay, so I found seven different species of brown algae, or maybe you found seven occurrences of brown algae. Take a closer look start making some recordings. Are they the same? Are they different? That's a great way to start to get to know your algae. You can also use this guide that we created at the museum, um, which are these like drawings um, of different types. So you can get to know some of our most common algaes. Um, and there's also like information about foraging, um, things like that. And that's available on our website. We'll send out that resource. And in the museum's online museum store, we also have some field guides that you can purchase. Um, another resource that we'll share out is limpets. I love limpets. Um, they're a volunteer organization. They do long-term monitoring along our coast. So they're looking for decades. They're looking for centuries of data so that we can better understand the impacts of like say climate change on our coastline. Um, but if you become a volunteer with them, they'll give you really great training on how to identify things like algae and other organisms because when, as you collect the data of like, you're doing a transect at this particular location, 
and you're saying that you found this, this many of this one species, they want to make sure that you know how to identify that species. So that's a great, a great resource for getting to know um, our intertidal organisms. And then also the Jepson um, seaweed database um, is more difficult, it's difficult to use, <laughs> but it's a great way to start like really dive in and, and see all the different types of algae that are out there. Um, I also want to take a moment to talk about indigenous relationships with the coast. Um, so a lot of the algae that uh, we have along the coast here is edible and has been harvested by people on the coast for millennia, as well as other um, organisms from the intertidal zone. And our coastline here in Santa Cruz is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Uipi tribe. Um, but there are also other tribes up and down the coast. Um, in Davenport, we were talking about um, the tide pools up there. So the tribe for Daven the Davenport area is um, the Chitoni tribe. So there's lots of different tribes up and down, um, but our general Santa Cruz region, um, the language spoken here is Owaswas. And these tribes certainly depended on our intertidal zone as a source of food. And um, shell mounds or middens are evidence of historic use of coastal resources. So this is one of the ways that we know this. And this photo is of a shell mound at Sand Hill Bluff in Davenport. And this is an archeological site that's managed by state parks and constituents of the dune midden. So like what's in the dune midden include various bird and mammal bones, shells of mussels, barnacles, and rarely, but sometimes abalone and rock oyster. Um, they've also found um, hammerstones, large side notched and foliated points of chert, and, um, and also just flakes of chert that are evidence of you know, someone working on the, the stone. And radiocarbon uh, dated items from this site indicate that the dune was first occupied um, starting around 3,500 BCE, so a long time ago, like over 5,000 years ago. Um, so this is one of the ways that we know about long-term use of coastal resources, but there are um, still indigenous people alive today who practice their cultural traditions, including uh, the Amamuxin tribal band who steward the area today, um, who also uh, share with our community um, their cultural practices. Um, and so, that includes harvesting food from the coast and indi indigenous people harvest food from the coast but also non-indigenous people harvest food from the coast so i also want to just take a moment to talk about um to talk about that and just ask has anyone here ever foraged anything from from the coast what kinds of things have you foraged mussels That's it. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. So there's, I mean, like, and just think about the things that you could possibly find. What do you think you could forage from the intertidal zone? What comes to mind? Your clams. Yeah, those clams again. <laughs> so clams, mussels, again, algae. I guess the crabs too. Crabs, for sure. And the, the um, algae too, I mean, I'm sure maybe most of us have eaten sushi. So nori is um, the name that we usually use to talk about the seaweed that, that's in our sushi. And that's a, a species that you can find here on the coast. Um, and most of the algae around here is edible. Some of it's more delicious maybe than others, but lots of foraging that can be had. Um, and I really like to talk about these human uses of these habitats, mainly because I feel personally, at least, that for me, a lot of my entry points to understanding nature have been through human use because I've realized like, oh my gosh, you can eat that? That's so cool. And all of a sudden I have this new appreciation for this tree, right? Um, and I think as we develop as naturalists, we maybe start to feel a little haughty about that. Um, maybe that's just me, but um, I feel like it's good for us to remember that like whatever those entry points are for people to appreciate their their ecosystems, let's like let's let's celebrate that. And that's the foundation of us then getting to the point of wanting to conserve. Um, so it may be that people are not foraging in the right ways, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be um, stewards eventually. They will be. We just have to like we have to help them. Right. And they already appreciate that location they maybe just don't know um, everything that there is to know about it yet. So I like to focus on these aspects. 
but we're going to do that a little. Um, one of the resources I love is from our friend Kirk Lombard, who gave a talk at the museum a few years ago, and he wrote this book. It's called The Sea Forager's Guide to the Northern California Coast. Um, and we may have it in our online store right now. I'm not sure. The library may have it as well for checkout. Um, and he writes, when you harvest your food from the wild, you become a member of a very complex food web. So the question arises, what sort of member do you want to be? Do you want to be a consumer? Do you want to be a citizen? And he continues, the citizen of the intertidal zone is a different species. She's educated about the coastal ecosystem and passionate about protecting it. He talks about how just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's ethical. Um, so sure, the law might say that you can take, you know, a fish that's four inches long, but maybe the more that you know about that ecosystem, the more you know that like that particular species doesn't spawn until it's older. And it's a good practice to wait until it's larger because it's likely that it was able to spawn. Um, and if you take them too young before they've spawned, then you're having these longer term impacts on the population. So it may be legal, but is it ethical? Um, sure, you may have a permit to forage in a particular spot, but you see a bunch of people already harvesting there. Is it ethical to go and continue to take more and more? Um, so we always recommend just being mindful of your own observations in addition to knowing the regulations imposed by government agencies. Um, and again, as a naturalist, the more that you make these observations, the, the more well-informed you're gonna be. So the more you're out there, the more you're observing, the better a naturalist you are. Um, but in general, we like to follow the know before you go um, mindset. And there's different ways, different things you should know. So one is what's the tide, right? So that's going to impact what you're able to collect. If it's high tide, that's, you're not going to be able to collect some of the things that you may uh, be interested in. Um, what are the regulations? So make sure to do your due diligence on learning what is allowed. Um, and also like, what are you harvesting? So making sure that you know enough about this ecosystem that you know how to, how to identify what it is that you're taking. And a good example, I think, for that is, um, this is part of our algae guide. And you see here the wakame or the winged kelp. Um, and we have a native species here that's the Alaria marginata. But there's also an invasive species that is Andaria pinatifida. So which one do you think you should harvest if you're going to go out and harvest? The non-native. Non-native. Why do you say that, Kathleen? Um, because in that way, you're getting something that you want, but you're also stewarding the environment in a way that promotes, promotes like native ecosystems. Yeah. And, you know, not all organisms that aren't native to a place are doing harm, but oftentimes they are. And again, the more you know about this ecosystem, the more you'll be able to make these informed decisions. But if an organism that has come in and is invasive is crowding out native species, is making it so that there's a less diverse ecosystem there, that's not good for that ecosystem. And so um, being able to identify the difference between the invasive and the native species is gonna be, is gonna be a good practice in your harvesting practices. So again, just the more you know. Um, and in terms of regulations, Fish and Wildlife is a great place to go to learn these things. Um, and oftentimes you do need a permit. And I would just recommend going and doing your own research for that. But I would say like, this is a great place to start. Um, and for algae, you don't necessarily need a permit. You can go out there and you can harvest up to 10 pounds of wet algae. But that also depends on where you are. So just because they're saying that here, you also need to be mindful of if you're in a marine protected area. Are we in a marine protected area? along the coast here in Santa Cruz? We are. And so you can't do that here. Um, in order to collect algae along the coast of our marine protected area, you need a science collecting permit. So again, just really do your due diligence of learning, um, learning these regulations um, before, before you go out. And you can ask the museum too, shoot us an email, we'll, we'll help you. Um, there's also just best practices for going tide pooling, whether you're wanting to harvest or not. Um, let's see, does any, I want to see what you guys think. What's a good practice? So you're going out tide pooling. What do you do? What do you not do? Try not to tread on the animals, on the um, creatures. Walking on the organisms at, as much as possible. Sure. What else? 
Don't touch unless you absolutely have to. Okay. And for that one, I would say too, like, don't touch unless you absolutely have to. So why would you have to? Well, maybe it's that like you, there's a good benefit for you to, for touching it. So we at the museum are not against people touching or even picking things up because there's so much to learn um, from these organisms by looking a little closer, but there's some best practices for doing it, which I'll share. Um, anything else? Don't take or leave anything that you yeah. don't have to. <laughs> yeah, like leave it as you found it, right? So don't take it. And also don't leave like any of your trash behind or any of your collecting gear, be mindful of that. I would say the, the caveat to that is if you find some litter out there, take that. <laughs> um, yeah, so some best practices. This is me on a, on a walk that we did maybe last, a year and a half ago. Um, so walk, don't run. And this is so for your own safety. That's a good best practice. Um, so that you don't trip and fall on unfamiliar terrain and also when things are slippery and also when like there's rocks that are loose, things like that. Um, but also walking exerts less pressure on the animal. So if you do have to walk on organisms, you're doing less harm. Um, so step on bare rock rather than on living organisms wherever possible. And I say wherever possible because it's often not possible. And also because as we've been learning, these organisms go through a lot of tumultuous activity every day. They are used to being trampled. And so um, they're, they're well adapted to us walking on them in a way that they're not gonna be harmed by it as long as we're doing it carefully. Um, so definitely avoid walking on them if you can, but if you, if you have to step on a, on a patch of mussels, for instance, those mussels are gonna be fine. Um, explore along the exposed beach or from the edge of a tide pool rather than venturing into the water. And so this is why going at low tide is good because you have more to, to venture into, um, but it provides better viewing conditions for you. It's easier to see things. Um, and it also allows animals to remain undisturbed. If you're walking through the water, you're, you're being a lot more intrusive. Um, turn over only small rocks and do so gently. Um, so a quick turnover may crush animals that are next to the rock or darting under the rock as their hiding place is uncovered. So be really careful. Um, also, if you're gonna be putting your hands in the pools and if you're gonna be touching organisms, wet your hands with seawater sea water from the beach before touching or holding an animal exposed by the tide. And this is just gonna make it so that you're not like getting your, your hand stuff on them as much, um, you're getting seawater on them instead. And then also, if you are moving rocks, replace the rock carefully and replace also any seaweed um, or anything else you've moved around to, to take a closer look. I mean, that's a great tip for going tide pooling. Lift that seaweed up, lift that algae up. Um, that's where a lot of interesting stuff's gonna be, um, but just also put it back because it's helpful cover. Other things I'll just put out there is like, think about where the sun is and what shadow you're leaving on it. If you're walking up to a pool that you wanna explore and your shadow has just crossed over it, that's gonna be an indicator for a lot of organisms to like hide. So, so, be, so be mindful of that. Any other tips that anyone wants to share? Okay. It's slippery. What was that? It's sometimes slippery on the rocks. Yes. And real grass. Yeah, that's a really good point. So like be mindful of what shoes you're wearing, good shoes. And then also um, try to always like, like have two points of contact at all times. So if you're taking a step, before you like lift up your, your next foot, make sure that that step is like sound. Um, that's a really good point, Sylvia, I think that was. Wait, I'm sorry, Marisa, did you mention also um, bringing like a headlamp? I didn't. Um, do you like bringing headlamps, Kathleen? One time I was in a place where other people had brought headlamps and realized that it was actually really useful because if you're at like an evening thing or sometimes early in the morning and you're like moving things around it's like hard to see and it's like easier to be able to move things with both hands like safely for you and the creatures if you're not also trying to like hold up a phone light you know to look at something especially if it's like getting dark but it's like a really good tide pooling day and so you don't want to give it up for sure that's a that's a great thing to bring up because like we saw in our tide chart earlier our only good uh, low tide of the next couple of days is at one in the morning. So if you want to go out for it, it's going to be dark. And so you want to be safe. And if you are holding a flashlight, it's going to be less safe than if it's on your head. So headlamps are good. And also um, lights are, can totally be useful. It's going to scare away some organisms, but it's also going to let you see the ones that aren't scared away. 
Um, also, I just wanted to make sure that we talk about climate change. So Jen opened us up with, with uh, acknowledging that what our community is facing is a direct result of climate change and climate change is gonna continue to impact our habitats here in Santa Cruz. And every month we're gonna be talking about climate change impacts on the habitat du jour. Um, so can we just kind of like, as a group, think about it, climate change, inner tidal zone, What's the deal? What do we think is going to happen? What is happening? What do you guys think? The ocean's becoming more acid and that affects the shells and the living of the animals. Mm -hmm. And the levels are rising. So those, if the sea levels are rising, then the tide pools won't be as exposed as much, or you could get, I don't know if you'd get a bigger change in tides, but that would also be a problem. I guess you wouldn't get a bigger change in tides, would you? Um, I don't know if the amount of like additional seawater would have a big enough impact, like if it would be enough to actually have an impact on like that large of a system, but certainly it would have an impact on like where our inner tidal zones are, right? And like if those, um, but it yeah, shifts like upwards. Was, what was that? The intertidal zones would shift up, shift up the beach. Yeah, and like, are has there been enough time for those for that erosion to impact that rocky zone? Like, how long does that take? That's also something I'm not sure about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, would that be actually like, you know, removing habitat possibilities? I've also been contemplating with the fires, um, thinking about, you know, people talk about the, the ash in the air and that the ash is made up of not just wood, but there's other particulates and chemicals in the, in the ash, how that affects animals when it lands on the beach or on um, in the water and also what the runoff from that going into rivers and then into the ocean looks like. Yeah, Australia had a lot of reports about that after their wildfires in January. It, it, after it rained and everyone was so excited about it because it got rid of the fires, but then you see all the areas that were cleared by fire just were inundated with just runoff into the oceans and then just fish kills like crazy. Yeah, and I wonder like if it's like little bits of ash fall into like a tide pool, that's like getting constantly, because I had this question too, I was thinking about it, like, because the tide pool is such a, a small little micro environment there. Um, but I don't know if enough ash with our current fires would like fall into that. But yeah, maybe, um, maybe the, you know, the grand scheme of things, all of those fires um, and then along our coast zone with, you know, enough of it could pile up to have an impact. We'll have to see. And there are fires happening all over the globe right now too. There are plenty of fires happening in Brazil right now as well. Liberia. Um, well, I'll share with you guys a little bit of what I found about um, the impacts of climate change on the intertidal zone, and I'll share that, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> we don't know enough is kind of what I learned from doing my research on this. Um, this is not uh, an area that we've, like, and also thinking about algae, like some of these algae live for 90 years, so we just don't really know a lot of what these impacts could possibly um, be for some of these organisms, but I'll share that one of the studies, a lot of the studies I found were from like the mid 90s, um, but I did find this one from 2015, so it's one of the, the more recent ones, and according to this study, um, what we can tell about climate change and elevated CO2 levels in marine systems is that warming dramatically increases net community production and particularly algae, and so if um, ocean temperatures are warmed, then you are going to see that certain organisms benefit a lot from that and like kind of like bloom. And I think we've all heard of toxic algae blooms, maybe. Um, that's something that like we hear about every year here on the coast um, because it has impacts on, um, on our organisms. And it has impacts on foraging, too. I should note that, that like that's one of the things that you learn about when you go foraging for mussels. Um, things like that is that you have to be mindful of whether or not they have toxic demoic acid, which is caused by toxic algae blooms. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't share that. Um, but so that's one impact that we can see from climate change. Um, and basically the study also just said that like these systems may shift rapidly. So it, it's, it may be this kind of tipping point um, system. Also, 
Uh, Sylvia brought up that the issue of ocean acidification and its effect on shells. So what happens is that there's less calcium carbonate available in the water, in the ocean, because of decreasing ocean pH, which, is, which means that it's ocean acidification. Um, and so this has a long-term effect for shelled organisms where they just, there's not enough calcium carbonate for them to create their shells. So it's not that like organisms that have shells, their, their shells are getting depleted um, in a way that's like killing that organism. It's that it could have these long-term impacts on shelled organisms being able to create, to, to survive because they may not be able to create shells as easily. Um, and while tidal organisms are able to tolerate a fairly wide range of conditions, as we've been learning, additional stresses such as warmer water and more acidic water may cross thresholds that they cannot tolerate and wipe out intertidal communities. So that's kind of where we are right now um, with that. And that's one of the reasons why Limpets, one of those organizations I shared earlier, is like so great because one of the, what they're doing is these long-term monitoring projects, which are really going to help give us this database that um, and data bank that um, that will help us to better understand what to do and what is happening. Um, does anyone want to add anything to that? Oh, I can. I know with algal blooms, like you think, oh, it's great because they're growing. And so they'll take in more carbon dioxide and decrease things overall. But they grow so fast, they get depleted in some nutrients and then they die off. And then as they die off, the bacteria that breaks them down is going to uh, take up all the oxygen and then that kills all the animals in the tide pool. So it, it's a big problem. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, all right, so I mean, I hate to kind of end on like a <laughs> uh, not so pleasant thing, but you know, as we're learning with what's going on with our community, it's, it's more important than ever that we have these conversations and that we keep this at the forefront of our mind. Um, and also note that like, while this is a dramatic event that's, that's occurring all around us right now, um, there are these like smaller stories that are also happening that are gonna have major impacts down the road that we may not know about yet. Um, and so, so thanks for having this conversation um, with all of us. Uh, I will give you some fun homework though. Well, this is the same homework that we gave last month because I thought that it was would be good for, for all of us to be reminded about. Um, and that is to, so Jen's gonna share out a list of resources, which she'll share in just a moment of what all those are. Um, so use the tide chart resource and plan out a trip to the tide pools. That's what I'm, so it's a fun homework assignment. Um, so you'll, you'll get to learn how to use these tide charts. Um, and then also while you're out there, remember that a naturalist is someone who makes observations over and over and derives meaning from them. So do that by making some recordings while you're out there too. And it, you know, it's just a good reminder. I, I go out to the, to these, you know, habitats all around me all the time and don't make these records. Don't, you know, like sometimes I do, but oftentimes I forget and I, you know, I'm just going out on a hike or something. And um, I just think it's good to constantly have the reminder of how beneficial it is to, to, um, to make these practices commonplace. Do you use um, iNaturalist? Yeah, yeah. Do it's you, so do you good. Why you love iNaturalist with everyone? Oh, it's so good. So it's an app where you can take, you upload your pictures of your observations and it, beca it's part of, it, it's, it becomes a citizen science project where it, it geocaches where you took the picture and what time and then it's just it crowdsources for identification. So if you either you know it or you don't know what it is, you put it out there into the cloud and then scientists can say, oh, look, you saw this at a certain place. Or people can come together and say, oh, that's definitely this species or that species. And I know there's been several cases where people have uh, uploaded th uh, things to iNaturalist and scientists have said, we haven't seen that species in X amount of years, but here's proof that it's still in this range. Yeah, that's fabulous. I'm just like, for me, it's so useful for me because it helps me identify what it is that I'm looking at. Most of the, the species, pretty much all of the species that I've learned in the past year have been directly because of my naturalist. Yeah, I and you can definitely you can see what you're going to see. Like if you like look on the map, like oh, I'm going to this tide pool, what could I maybe see out there? Yeah, I've planned trips about seeing like a particular calicordis lily. Like, okay, where do I go to see this lily? Um, yeah, does anyone else want to share any resources that have been helpful or any like, you know, other words uh, about what we've been talking about today? Someone in the chat earlier mentioned an app called Tides Now for Android and might be on Apple devices as well. Um, that uh, it gives you the tides with sun and moon rise as well as tides for different locations in Santa Cruz and Monterey and, and California. Well, that sounds pretty handy. Awesome.
Okay, well, um, Jen, do you want to share resources then that we're going to be sharing out with everyone? It's a long list, I think. <laughs> it is a long list. Um, and I just wanted to very quickly thank you, Marisa, for all of that um, fascinating information. And the, the intersections of food and culture and history are one of my favorite knowledge points. So thank you for adding that in there because that really makes me think about things differently. Let me, boop, there we go. Um, so yeah, I just want to mention to everyone that we will be sharing out this resource list that Marisa and I have compiled. It's a combination of web resources, um, books that the Santa Cruz Public Libraries carry, as well as databases that we pay for. So there are some databases, especially academic ones that can be cost prohibitive. So with your library card, um, you can get access to these. And the two I wanna bring your attention to uh, are Greenfile and Explora. And these are, like I mentioned, these are the um, ones you would normally hit a paywall for, but they have tons of um, full text articles about things. Like I just did a quick search for climate change and marine life. And you can find um, both um, citations and full text articles of um, from from journals um, about the green file is specifically about um, ecological issues so there's tons of different publications that you can pull from some are older some are more recent um, but you can see this is just the a's and there are tons of them so depending on what you're looking for if you're doing specific research for something um, this is a great place where you can go and find those academic articles and things from different publications and I will say that these are some of the titles we have in our catalog right now. We are still lending. We only have three libraries doing curbside right now. We had to close two of them because of the fires. So we may be a little bit impacted, um, but you can still place requests on, on things and have them delivered to either downtown, Live Oak, or Aftos branches. So if you live in the county and you don't mind you know, making a, a quick trek, um, we have all these available. And we, this is just like a, a brief selection. I wanted to keep it down to one page. And then down below, you'll see all of, many of the resources that uh, Marisa mentioned, web resources, as well as a couple of my own that I've added. So yeah, and I will email this out to folks. Um, we had some issues last month with accessibility because it's a, an organizational Google Doc. So I'm sending it out as a regular document this time. So hopefully you won't have any issues with that. Yeah, so you'll be receiving two emails from us after this instead of one. And please open both of them, because what's the other one, Jen? <laughs> the other one is a survey to let us know how we did this evening. Um, and those are very helpful for us. Um, we try to improve all of the virtual programs we're doing. Um, believe it or not, we are people just like you. And we are also living through this pandemic. So I'm um, trying to figure out, <laughs> yes, we're also in m and and crabs. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're trying to make these programs um, as as good for you as we possibly can and we can't do that without your feedback so uh, you will get an automated email with the survey link as well as links to sign up for the libraries and museums respective newsletters as well as become a member of the museum if you're interested in that and then the email that you'll get from me will be the resource link great and I guess that's it. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you are safe and happy wherever you are. Uh, go ahead and register for next month if you like. It should be open now. Um, like Marisa said, that will be Redwoods, not Coastal Prairies. We will kick Coastal Prairies perhaps to October. Um, but that doesn't mean it's less important. It just means that we're talking about Redwoods right now. Yeah, Coastal Prairies. Coastal Prairies are also very much impacted by wildfires. Yes. Yeah. Very well um, that history too, but I, yeah, Redwoods. Are yeah, Redwoods are the conversation these days. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much, and we hope to see you next month. And take care and have a good night. Thanks so for joining us, guys, and for participating. It was great seeing you all.